Good evening and welcome to Have I Got News For You. I'm Adrian Dunbar. In the news this week, after the BBC cancels all regular programmes on Friday, the head of scheduling opens his viewer feedback inbox. <laughs> As one dog grooming salon reopens in Bicester, Alan Carr's pug arrives for a nail trim. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and as gyms reopen across the country, a new public information film asks men to re-familiarise themselves with the equipment. On Paul's team tonight is a hugely successful political journalist. I'm not saying he's powerful and influential at Westminster, but he's just had a text from David Cameron. <laughs> Please welcome Tim Shipman. <laughs> and with Ian tonight is a comedian who presents the jewellery-making contest All That Glitters as a reality TV show where contestants show off the rings. It's second only to Naked Attraction. Please welcome <laughs> Catherine Ryan. <laughs> So, the first question of round one covers a momentous story that we simply can't avoid. As you all know, last Friday, the nation was united in sorrow following the sad announcement that the much-loved MasterChef final had been taken. <laughs> <laughs> Incidentally, if you are offended by jokes about Prince Philip, that's fine. It's what he would have wanted. <laughs> I just want to say, Adrian, this is difficult for you because it is, you know, a major, you know, historical figure has died, but when Margaret Thatcher died, mm. Brian Blessed hosted the show, ah. and you can imagine that two minutes silence was very hard to achieve. <laughs> <laughs> the BBC coverage of the Prince Philip story has become the most complained about event in TV history. They had so many complaints, 110,000 of them, that they had to make a special form to accommodate them. Viewers switching on BBC Four and settling back to watch Sounds of the 70s saw this announcement and assumed a nuclear war had started. <laughs> it is classic. I mean, in television, they're always like generals fighting the last war. This was about the Queen Mother, and the BBC got it in the neck then because they didn't put on enough coverage of the Queen Mother, so they thought, this time, we'll have nothing but coverage mm. when this royal dies. So we had this just absolute tsunami of coverage, which was on literally all the time. And even if you were quite interested at the beginning, and I am quite interested, you know, I sort of... Let's go back and do the Second World War and naval battles, let's have it all. By the end of it, I'm going, stop! <laughs> it's just, they had the same thing on every channel all the time. And I know you're, you, you're going to say this is sour grapes because we were taken off, which it is. <laughs> um, you already touched on the massive row in 2002 after the Queen Mother died. Yes. When newsreader Peter Sissons was accused of having a too frivolous tie Mm. and a suit that wasn't dark enough. <laughs> and it emerged that as he got ready to announce the Queen Mother's death, Peter Sissons was told to choose a burgundy tie, not a black one, and the news editor said to him, don't go overboard, she's a very old woman. <laughs> 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 ITV1 also pulled their schedule, though not ITV2, 3 and 4, and all those other rubbish ones. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> they couldn't really pull the kind of names the BBC had. Who did ITV have on? Was it Alan Titchmarsh? <laughs> no. Was that, was that BBC? Actually, it was Theresa May. Ah. And what was it about her, according to Philip Schofield, <laughs> that made her an appropriate contributor? Had she put her £1,000 leather trousers on again? <laughs> <laughs> Let's have a look, shall we? Someone who saw that close-up was our former Prime Minister, Theresa May. Well, she herself had a husband called Philip to turn to. <laughs> <laughs> That's a fabulous, fabulous segue that was. Yes. Yeah. How did Radio 1 Dance Station adapt in preparation for the breaking news last Friday. Did they play solemn house music? <laughs> they kind of did. Let's find out. <laughs> yeah. He's looking good, though. <laughs> <laughs> Why not as a remix? Yeah, I, you know, I have definitely heard worse mashups. I kind of enjoyed that little interlude. The thing I liked about all this was that normally when someone dies, all the 
hideous stuff about them comes out of the woodwork. With Prince Philip, um, there have been so many terrible stories while he was alive that most of the coverage was about what a nice bloke he was. <laughs> Apparently, when the Queen had her coronation and she walked into the back room afterwards, he said, where did you get that hat? <laughs> and I thought, it was the time he said. There was a very, very good story about... Um, him at school um, when they tried to set up a sort of Hitler Youth um, organisation and he refused to join and then whenever they did the salute he would say, I'd like to go to the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> Early Philip Banter. Right. This, of course, is the death of the Duke of Edinburgh. His Royal Highness the Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, Earl of Merioneth, Baron Greenwich, Royal Knight of the Most Noble Order of the Garter, Extra Knight of the Most Ancient and Most Noble Order of the Thistle, Member of the Order of Merit, Knight Grand Cross of the Royal Victorian Order, Grand Master and First and Principal Knight Grand Cross of the Most Excellent Order of the British Empire, Knight of the Order of Australia, Additional Member of the Order of New Zealand, Extra Companion to the Queen's Service Order, Royal Chief of the Order of Lugahu, Extraordinary Companion of the Order of Canada, Extraordinary Commander of the Order of Military Merit, Lord of Her Majesty's Most Honourable Privy Council <laughs> of the Queen's Privy Council for Canada, Personal Aide-de-Camp to Her Majesty, Lord High Admiral of the United Kingdom. Mother of God, how big is that headstrong <laughs> Last week, there was an outcry when the BBC suspended most of its programming to make space for coverage of Philip's death. According to The Guardian, BBC4 was taken off air, though we should point out there are no witnesses to corroborate. <laughs> <laughs> the Times showed how the hearse will make its way from Windsor Castle to St George's Chapel. Now, listen, fellas. If there's one thing I've learned, it's never reveal the true root of a convoy. <laughs> <laughs> Paul and Tim, take yes. a look at this. Yes, oh, that's the moment, I suppose, when uh, people... Freedom! There we are, gather outside. Live from Blackpool, it says there, so I have no reason to doubt it. That's not a good look if you're a hairdresser. Yeah, everything's opening <laughs> up again, or a lot of things are. The things that you can do indoors, things you can't do outdoors. Correct. Correct, there we are. This is the news that lockdown restrictions have been eased in some parts of the UK and that the national target to vaccinate the over-50s has been met. Yeah, I know the over-45s can now get a jab, which is very exciting for me personally, but um, even more exciting for all those uh, middle-aged, middle-class people who are finally getting some drugs for the first time since Glastonbury 2019. <laughs> <laughs> Why has our vaccination rollout been so successful? That's it. <laughs> No, I just, I don't believe what, it's difficult when they say it's been a real success because I feel like the government always says what we've done is a great success. Mm. And then they talk sense sometimes, but I feel like if wisdom started coming from the toilet, <laughs> I would be suspicious because I'd say, well, that sounds true, but it's coming from the toilet. Yeah. And that's how I feel anytime Matt Hancock speaks. <laughs> but there was a very, very good guide this week. The prime minister was asked um, why he thought our figures were going down so much, and he said, the important thing to remember, it was not the vaccination, it was the lockdown. And I thought, great, it's the vaccination. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we've now got our relationship with the EU on an even keel as well, haven't we? Um, we're sending them the Kent variant, and they're sending us the vaccine. <laughs> it's a pretty good deal. Really. You're way out of line, fella. Uh -huh. Right. <laughs> so what have you all done this week that wasn't legal last week? <coughs> <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Pubs, shops, salons and staycations are back. Let's see two people delighted to be able to visit a restaurant in Cranley, Surrey. <laughs> yes, that looks fun, doesn't it? I bet it was fun. If you were having soup, it would take you about four years to finish it. <laughs> Lots of my friends saying, oh, let's go out and have a drink, and I think... No, I have done that in lockdown. <laughs> That's the one thing I think I've probably got quite good at. Have you been sitting on a park bench on your own? Ian, with a, with a... Swearing with yeah. a bottle of cider. Yeah. yeah. Hey. And a newspaper. Yeah. Bloody Cameron. Yeah. <laughs> but it is difficult going back to actual measures when you're not free pouring them yourself in the lounge. <laughs> that was an adjustment. Mm. We had a pub lunch outside and I just thought, this, something's wrong with this fridge. <laughs> I didn't make it. <laughs> and what did the staff at Magnolia Barbering in Chesterfield have to do. Did they have to employ a hairdresser for every single hair that was being cut? No, they had to put up nightclub-style barriers outside to control the crowds of men Whoa. desperate for a haircut. <laughs> Boris Johnson apparently was amongst those saying he needed his haircut badly. 
And this week, someone made his wish come true. <laughs> so how were visitors to Alton Towers theme park greeted when it reopened? Uh, with heavy sarcasm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Hit in the face with wet fish. Well, they get free ride. According to the Daily Telegraph, a welcome party included Eric the Yeti and Darwin the Dodo, which came as a disappointment to Eric and Darwin, who didn't know their colleagues had given them those nicknames. <laughs> <laughs> now, shall we have a look at how one reporter covered the reopening of Blackpool Pleasure Beach? Yes. Well, there's a lot of work to do here at Blackpool Pleasure Beach, getting ready for the crowds to come back on Monday! <laughs> <laughs> Here's a bit of the work that they've got to do! <laughs> that man there, does he always shout like that, but he thought to try and cover it to put him on a roller coaster? <laughs> yeah, he probably always does. Over at IKEA in Bristol, according to The Times, the store had a relaxed air with customers limited to a thousand at a time. <laughs> while Rachel Kipling drove to John Lewis just to breathe it in. <laughs> <laughs> and what did the chairman of Nerve Tag, Nerved N E R V T A G, have to say about all this. Oh, is it one this, of the subcommittees? Yes, yeah. this is the new and emerging respiratory virus threats advisory group. Chairman Professor Peter Horby was asked about the easing of lockdown restrictions, and he told Times Radio, hopefully it won't translate too much into hospitalizations and deaths. <laughs> well, that's the spirit. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, we yeah. mentioned Nigel Farage's venture into personal video messaging last week. Yes. Let's take a look at how that's going. Right, yeah, lovely. Happy birthday, Hugh Janus. Is <laughs> 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 uh -huh. that him looking into a mirror? <laughs> <laughs> so this is the joyous lifting of lockdown, or if you're watching the repeat, the reckless harbinger of the third wave. <laughs> <laughs> One vaccine development this week is that AZ has been backed by the MHRA and EMA using data from the ONS and the PHE to support the JCV. I, I mean, hang on. I only said yes to this show to get away from my acronym. <laughs> <laughs> Dangerous clots are also in the news due to Johnson & Johnson. Well... Stanley and his missus certainly produced one. <laughs> <laughs> According to the Mirror, on Monday, four million pints of beer were sold in the UK, the equivalent of 92 pints a second, which proves if there's one thing we can roll out faster than the vaccine, it's the barrel. <laughs> How I missed those spur of the moment impromptu quick drinks with mates, where you just go online to the local pub's website, access the mm -hmm. booking form, find an hour and a half <laughs> window on April the 23rd between 5.45 and 7.15 in the garden, use a credit card to pay a deposit to secure the booking and enter the names, emails and mobile phone numbers of each of the people who will be attending <laughs> and chill. <laughs> <laughs> According to the sun, on a cold Monday night, people kept warm as they drank outdoors thanks to blankets and hot water bottles. And in Northern Ireland, blazing police cars. <laughs> so, on to round two. The Investigation Board of News. Fingers on buzzers, teams. <laughs> What do you think, Tim? Well, it's David Cameron. That's right. This is, this is the part of the show where we talk about nicking bent lobbyists, <laughs> allegedly. Um, he got involved with this financier chap called Lex Greensill, uh, Lex Luthor not being available that week. Um, <laughs> and he got him to come and work for him. And then when he stopped being Prime Minister, um, he started doing some work for Mr Greensill in return, phoning up all his old mates and asking for lots of money. Unfortunately, most of his old mates told him to get stuffed. Um, <laughs> Boris Johnson has been shocked to discover that all this has been going on, so he's ordered uh, an independent inquiry. And it's very urgent. It only took 11 years to be investigated. <laughs> <laughs> but Dave is going to turn up. He's going to answer all the questions, uh, though I think you'll find, Adrian, that he does want to be... Uh, quizzed by someone one rank senior to himself. <laughs> um, but, you know, Dave is very, very sorry. He's very, very sorry he got caught. Boris basically <laughs> said he was going to set up an inquiry into um, Cameron because he doesn't like him anyway, so that's great. Um, and he thought, I'll throw him under the bus and that'll do. And then the inquiry um, has generated a whole lot of stuff about Boris too. Um, really? Yes, and about um, his involvement um, and him being lobbied by the... Um, 
Saudi Arabian Prince Mohammed bin Salman, who apparently is able to ring up our Prime Minister and say, I don't like what's happening with the Premier League, sort it out. The Prince then rang Boris and said, would you correct the decision they've made? It's fairly straightforward. I think they've got the idea that British Prime Ministers are there just to do whatever they say. Mm. I mean, Cameron, this is a year after the Khashoggi affair, mm. is, is in a tent going mm. camping in Saudi Arabia uh, with the Prince. You know, there's a crackling fire. Chuck another journalist on it. <laughs> it's reminiscent of Glastonbury after it went pot. <laughs> you seem to be obsessed with Glastonbury. Were you turned down from headlining at the pyramid stage at some point? In your <laughs> yeah, I've, uh, I've, my puppetry of the penis has never yet been uh, accepted <laughs> as a new so. But, well, I mean, when I look at Cameron, I, I, I just want to question, I want to say, what has happened to us? When did we stop caring about honesty no, and integrity? Ah, yeah. It's not a rhetorical question. You know, and a barefaced liar <laughs> promoted to our highest office. Don't forget that either. <laughs> David Cameron did say he learned one lesson. He said um, that when he was exerting influence within government on behalf of private financial service companies, that he should do that meddling through the official channels and not via texting. Right. So, so in a it's letter. Not sorry, but it's sort of a lesson learned. This isn't a grey area. These people who procure mm. this then go and work for them. And now we find out that a civil servant, while he's a civil servant, oh, did I not mention I've got another job? The head of procurement. Mm. I know exactly how you guys feel because mm. this relentless dishonesty is. Uh, frustrating, and I experience it whenever people talk about, do the Kardashians edit their photos on Instagram? <laughs> <laughs> what is Keir Starmer suggesting should happen? He wants another inquiry, this time run by MPs. Yes. Hurrah! He's also saying this. Let's have a look. We don't need another Conservative Party appointee marking their own homework. Yeah. Actually, Mr Speaker, the more I listen to the Prime Minister, more I think that Ted Hastings and AC12 are needed to get to the bottom of this one. <laughs> well, that's why we have tougher laws on our lobby, a great shame uh, that Labour opposed them. Uh, Mr Speaker, yes, we are getting on with rooting out bent coppers, Mr Speaker. <laughs> <laughs> yes, very good, Boris. Yes, for, well done for picking up the torch there, yes. And finally, let's have a quick look at how Alex Salmon's Alba party are doing in their efforts to promote themselves in Scotland. <laughs> <laughs> oh, mother of God. <laughs> right, this is the news that David Cameron will face an investigation over his role with finance firm Greensill Capital. Despite dragging Mohammed bin Salman into the Greensill scandal, Cameron remains on good terms with the Saudi prince. In fact, he's just been invited to a free stay at the Istanbul embassy. <laughs> right, fingers on buzzers, teams. <laughs>this must be a story judging by a picture that a marrow has managed to grow the baldest man in Shropshire. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's right. This... It's right? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not right. Oh, you said it was right. No, no, it's not right. No, well, no, it's not right. It was right. I can confuse a stupid person. <laughs> I love this man. His name is Gerald, and he's a septuagenarian mm -hmm. who's gone viral, which is the last thing a man in his 70s wants to hear during a <laughs> pandemic. But he is a 70-something-year-old influencer, huge following, and he grows big veg. Yep, that's him. This is the news that 72-year-old retired barge controller turned gardener Gerald Stratford is Gucci's latest supermodel, right? <laughs> Shall we take a look at Gerald in Gucci ads, right? Yes. Here's the rather dashing Gerald showing some models a feast of salad. <laughs> and it's really good to show yes. thin city dwellers what food is. Yes, that's <laughs> right. And <laughs> here, he, here he is watching on as one of the models vandalises his cabbage patch. <laughs> Actually, I assumed he was holding a cabbage, but it might just be the sleeve of that Gucci jacket. <laughs> <laughs> Gerald became a Twitter superstar after a picture of his King Edwards went viral. I'm sorry, how does a picture like that go viral? No, a man I... holding a dish full of potatoes. What, 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 what's gone wrong with the world when that goes by? So when did we start caring about... No, that's... I mean, look, there's monster views of the earth from outer space. A man holding a load of potatoes. Click, click, click. I don't get it. Well, they I turned don't... off Gardner's Question Time last Friday and people needed an outlet. Ah, and he's very cool. charismatic. Ah. He always says good morning in his videos. Yeah. He's ah. a real lovable chap. Well, look, if he'd got a bigger bowl, he wouldn't have to hold three potatoes in his hand. 
That's where he's gone wrong. Maybe that's why people went viral. Yeah, big bowl and a small measure of potatoes. Are we yeah, exactly. That right. Does anyone know what Gerald's speciality veg is? Carrots. Ooh. Here are his carrots. <laughs> Is it just this bloke's a little bloke? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's, he's only like about three foot six or something, and he's got a normal sized carrot. And everybody's going viral for no reason at all. Here are his enormous onions. <laughs> <laughs> this is looking more and more like a kink all the time. Yes. Would well, anyone like to see a gardener who's had slightly less good fortune than Gerald? Yes, we'd love to. There he is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> This is the news that giant vegetable grower Gerald Stratford has been signed up to be the face of Gucci's new collection. Gerald has grown carrots and parsnips that are three feet long, any one of which could feed all the other Gucci models for a year. <laughs> <laughs> so time now for the odd one out run. Fingers on buzzers teams, Leonardo da Vinci, two visitors at an art gallery, Sir Anthony Hopkins and Pig Castle. Well, it's all going to be art-related, obviously. Sir Anthony Hopkins played Leonardo da Vinci, didn't he? Um, I think he played Picasso, didn't Picasso. he? Picasso. And this pig is called Pig Casso. Yeah. Because he paints with his snout, allegedly, or, you know, uh, that looks like an accident to me, but apparently he's a genius. <laughs> <laughs> Sir Anthony paints. He, he does. does. Now you've got it. Yeah, uh, right. So they all paint. The pig paints, um, Sir Anthony paints. That couple, it can't be this easy. They're the only people who don't paint. Ian. Bang on again. Mm. They're all artists apart from the two visitors to a South Korean art gallery who painted on an artwork. So what made a young couple in Seoul think they could start painting on an artwork? They walked across <laughs> an installation not knowing it was an installation. Yes, the untitled piece by American graffiti artist Joe Wan, worth over 300,000, was displayed, unframed, in a shopping mall with paint cans and brushes scattered around oh. it. So they presumed it was a piece of participatory art. Mm. <laughs> Let's have a look at the painting. Ah. Oh. I, I don't think you need me to point out where they daubed the paint on it, you know, thus ruining it completely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there you are, you see. Hang on, I think I've met D.I. Kate Fleming in that underpass. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, so Leonardo da Vinci is, of course, an artist. But what has been it's revealed... It's tough, this quiz, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> He's giving you the answers here. <laughs> what has been revealed about him in a new documentary? Doesn't the aforementioned prince of Saudi have his most expensive work on a yacht and refuses to let it be displayed in a museum? Oh, this is Salvatore Mundi? Correct. Ah. And people aren't entirely sure whether this is a da Vinci or not. Mm. Mm -hmm. And there's a suggestion that the Saudi prince may have paid a phenomenal amount of money for something that is fake. Yes. Like David Cameron, possibly. <laughs> <laughs> Experts at the Louvre conducted X-ray analysis and Salvatore Mundi painting, previously thought to be by da Vinci, and concluded that he only contributed a few brush strokes, the lazy fackers. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that Jesus was a fan of indoor bowling. <laughs> <laughs> so, meanwhile, what has the talented artist and pig, Pig Casso, been <laughs> painting recently? I'll give you a clue. Here is the finished piece. That does look like Boris Johnson to me, I'll be honest. <laughs> well, actually, that's Prince Harry, apparently. Uh, and, uh, how do we know? The pig said. <laughs> Who is this beguiling creature? <laughs> Yes, it's Dolly Parton, Ooh. and, uh, yes. <laughs> That's it? Yeah, apparently. She's not aged well, is she? And who's this? That's Donald Trump. Correct. Wow! I've, I've got I'd... into the pig's genre How do you do that? Do You've you got do into that? the pig genre? Yeah. Have you? Yeah. <laughs> and finally, who's this fetching portrait of? Is this the uh, Bolton Wanderers reserve team? <laughs> no, that, no, this is actually a nude donkey. A nude, a nude donkey as opposed to one wearing a suit. No, I can't <laughs> believe how this show has deteriorated even now. Uh, yeah. I mean, what has happened to us? I mean... Yeah, when... yeah what, you know, exactly. What, uh, when did we yeah. stop caring? In, in, in our about... universal grief, we're, we're naming celebrities painted by a pig. <laughs> <laughs> the poor scene artist is called Pig Casso. It's a good name, but I'd have gone with Francis Bacon myself. Who also used to get slaughtered after a day's painting. <laughs> <laughs> and lastly, Sir Anthony Hopkins was meant to be attending the BAFTA Film Awards ceremony virtually on Sunday, but 
missed it because he was working on a painting in a hotel room. Oh. Yes. I've always wondered who did those paintings. <laughs> <laughs> Hopkins thanked his fellow castmates, saying, I want to go to all of your houses and kiss you, but I can't for various reasons. Yes, and those reasons are social distancing and consent. <laughs> <laughs> Time now for the Missing Words round, which this week features as its guest publication the newsletter of the MYA, Model Yacht Association. I'm guessing sales are done. <laughs> and we start with Mystery Tree Beast turns out to be... That's Nigel Farage. Ah, <laughs> 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 oh, yes, I know this. I saw a bin bag full of chickpeas. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, the answer is a croissant. Animal welfare what? officers in Poland were alerted to a mysterious beast in a tree which turned out to be a croissant. Here is the offending pastry. <laughs> <laughs> Next. Mystery. As hundreds of sheep, what? Are single. <laughs> Become lunch. Answer is stand in circle in field. Oh. Right. Yes, this is... Uh... Oh. Shall we have a look? Yeah, there they are. <laughs> if you want to know what's happening, really happening, the sheep taking the mickey out of the pigs in the next door field by doing an impression of a Cumberland sausage. <laughs> 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 and finally, if you ask most people what does the Model Yacht Association provide for its members, the first item usually mentioned is what? Friendship, fellowship, technical uh, solutions. Is it a yacht? <laughs> <laughs> Scurvy. <laughs> Sailor uniforms. Insurance. Insurance? <laughs> I remember reading a story about 30 years ago about a man who built a, a, a you know, scaled-down model of the Titanic. Yeah. <laughs> He launched it and it sank. <laughs> <laughs> well, as they say in Belfast, she was all right when she left here. <laughs> <laughs> the article goes on to reveal that the maximum limit for each claim is five million. Model yachts sound a bit sad, but they're currently the only way you can get sausages from Northern Ireland to Britain. <laughs> <laughs> And so the final scores are Ian and Catherine have six points and Paul and Tim have six points. Oh, very good. <laughs> and I leave you with the news that evidence comes to light that Robert Jenrick and Dominic Rabb are members of a secret fight club in the basement of number 10. <laughs> <laughs> Scientists announce that they have successfully created an artificial intelligence cyborg fusing Elton John and Jurgen Klopp. <laughs> <laughs> At a stag party in Berkshire, one frustrated partygoer realises that there must have been a typo in his online request for two strippers. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you and good night. <laughs> You have just seen her catch you some jokes. Why not join host Catherine Ryan on All That Glitters, Britain's next jewellery star. Press red now to watch an iPlayer. It's 40 years since their first hit record. Duran Duran with something you should know. You can go and dance and reminisce on BBC4 shortly. Next on One, we join Would I Lie To You?